I'm here to talk about the intersection of maps, citizenship education, and democracy. But first I want to go back to Emily's keynote this morning. She, she started by reminding us that we are in the territorial lands of Arapa. She told us about how hard it is to actually find that information. Here's why. We're in the area where several uh, Native American territories overlap. Here are the territories of the Ute and the Cheyenne. And you'll notice that we seem to be pretty close to the center of where their territories meet. And that's because while Boulder started as a mining town situated between the silver mines in the mountains and Denver with the trains going east, Denver was founded across the South Platte River from the seasonal, uh, seasonal encampments of the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. But the maps we normally use hide that history. These maps say this is how the world is while divorcing us from that. This map of indigenous territories exposes the history. This one of treaty lands exposes the injustice of that history. And this map of Native American languages exposes the hypocrisy of you're in America, you should speak English. And that's why the tools we use and what we decide, uh, what we decide to show shapes the world and how people understand it. And this is where I give you all a disclaimer. I'm not a geographer, I'm a content strategist, I'm a researcher in, in deliberative democracy, and I'm an anti-fascist social justice witch. Or to put it another way, I show how, I research how our tools um, shape how we interact with the world and work on building communities that connect persons to people. So I don't really have methods to teach you all. Instead, I sort of want to explore this question. And I want to spend some time with you all to build a framework for thinking about how our technology and our maps shape our politics. This map is pretty familiar to most of us. It's pretty efficient at getting us from point A to point B. And this sort of uh, task-driven mapping is great for particular tasks. But what have we lost from that? What if the shortest route isn't what we want? What if I want to map directions by a different criteria? What if I'm looking for a good nightlife? What if I have two hours to walk one mile and I need a quiet stroll before my next meeting? How do we create maps that don't just get people from A to B, but help people better know their neighborhoods and their community? And on the surface, this doesn't really seem like it has much to do with civic life or politics. But decades of white flight and the reliance on car-based living means that people drive from their garages to their work, to their restaurants, to their, uh, to their grocery store without paying much attention to anything in between. The car-based lifestyle has made us strangers to our neighbors. It makes driving 10 miles to the box store with the giant parking lot a whole lot easier than going half a mile to the town center. And for many, those, those popular stores with big parking lots are usually chains. And they're promoted to us on the maps, on our uh, mapping app, because the algorithms a lot of them use, um, use engagement metrics to set landmarks. And those metrics are often defined by what's most popular or what, or what we might like using the same prejudices that cause gentrification, push out black owned businesses and mom and pop shops. So here in the US, Google Maps and Facebook will tell us where a polling place is when there's a major election rolling around. But that data is incomplete. While they cover federal elections, they get a lot fuzzier around local governance. You can find your Congress critter, you can find your state senator, but not necessarily your county commissioner or when your city, uh, city council primary rolls around. And that's a problem because civic engagement isn't just about voting in major elections. It's about our relationship with our communities. It's whether you call the police uh, for a disturbance in a predominantly black neighborhood. It's whether you know the people at your local bodega or you just go to Target. It's about using the city park. It's about using the bike lanes. Civic engagement is about using the public resources, recognizing them as such, and participating in and having meaningful input into their governance. So before we talk about solutions and a role in them, I want to think about what democracy is and what makes it worthwhile. 
Normally this takes me five minutes, but we don't have that sort of time. So the short version. Democracy is where communities make decisions together. Democracy is about the legitimacy of the decisions that affect the body politic. It's about us having a say in the rules that govern us to make sure that our needs and our interests are considered and cared for. So let me say that again. Democracy is about legitimacy, not efficiency, not about choosing one person to make all the decisions and get the job done. It's about consultation and consent. So when we limit democratic participation to a few votes on the ballot, we make democracy too facile. Our voice becomes too ineffectual. Our ties to governance become too fragile. So what if our tools didn't just tell people where their polling station was, but also when the city council was considering to replace an underutilized park with private development? And I want to give you an example of that. A developer wanted to build a new property on an under, underutilized park block in a Taipei neighborhood. For, um, for context, Taipei is roughly the same uh, population density as New York City and Manhattan proper. So as part of the planning, the public commissioner put up signs next to the park, published ads in the newspaper, to tell the public of the plan and, and that, there were, uh, that there were town hall meetings. But nobody responded and nobody attended. So they went ahead with demolition. They were bringing, bringing in equipment, but then a student was walking home one day and she went, what the hell is going on? She asked her neighbors, they didn't know. So she called the, the public commissioner. This was about a week before demolition was about to start. Within three days, she organized all, the, all her neighbors and they stopped, uh, they stopped construction. And then the public commissioner started holding new public meetings. In those meetings, they found that the park was underutilized because it didn't have the facilities that the neighbors wanted. So the commissioner, the community, and the developer came up with a new plan. They got federal funds to, to build new facilities in the park. And they also gave the developer a chance to build a different building with public commercial space that, that, that would revitalize the neighborhood. After it was complete, people were using the park every day. So what if our maps didn't tell us to navigate around the construction, but that work was being planned, and they weren't going to include bike lanes, but town hall was on Tuesday? And that's why I say democracy isn't just about voting. Democracy is about being seen, being heard, and being res respected in public life. How do we empower people to better engage with our public spaces and shared infrastructures? So what if we took this map of Confederate monuments in the US, but also then included notes on what department was in charge of upkeep and the elected officials uh, in charge of governing it? So in red is North Carolina Senate District 14. If you know North Carolina politics, you'll know that the Republicans control the state government. Partially because, as this map shows, they gerrymandered the hell out of the whole state. They packed District 14 with as many uh, black neighborhoods as they could, and packing is the legal term here, and distributed the rest of the black communities across multiple districts and so they, they'd never be able to build a large enough block to win any other, uh, any other district in this area. That's called stacking. In Districts 20 and 22, they didn't just split neighborhoods, they actually split houses. And to determine where these people vote, they take aerial photography of the house, and then they guess where the master bedroom is. Creepy. So with districts like this, how do you know whose yard signs you should pay attention to? How do you even talk to your neighbors about who or what to vote for when you don't even know where you're supposed to vote or where they're supposed to vote. Gerrymandering doesn't just disenfranchise people by rendering their votes moot. It nullifies one of the most effective forms of civic, civil discourse, the neighborhood. So right now, 
many redistricting plans happen pretty opaquely. The party in power hires a mapping firm for about a half a million dollars, and they put together an algorithm that, pa that passes state regulation but cuts the map in a way that, is, that benefits them. How do we make that process more transparent? What it would it mean to require public input into districting? What would a tool for substantive public input actually look like and actually be useful? And it can't just be us as the experts building these tools and telling people what they need. Because too often innovation from tech is about the disruptive idea that moves everything to a new paradigm. As the one designing and building the new world, we are imposing our worldview on those who come from completely different life experiences from our own. And that means we reinforce existing systems of oppression without actually understanding them. Which means we make, we make the complexity easier to access for the powerful, but leaving marginalized communities even further behind. So how do we build tools for everyone? How do we build tools that understand, for us to understand how our daily lives are shaped by our communal decisions and policies? How do we expose those policies and empower people in participating in making them? Jeffrey from OSM Africa and Emily this morning showed us what, when people control their own maps, they're better connected to their communities and their homes, and they, have, they ultimately have better control over their politics. How do we build on that work? How do we so support more work like it? How do we help distant communities share their stories so, they can better under so we can better understand and support one another? How do we do it in a way that respects people's agency and their labor, in a way that respects their privacy and their ownership? Because we can't demand that marginalized communities give us the data that they made for themselves. We have to prove that we are worthy of their trust. Because this knowledge belongs to the people, not the corporate interests who would greedily gobble it up for themselves or sell off and monetize. So right now, our culture thinks of government and governance as that thing in the corner, the one that needs to stay out of the way. We only talk of it as a thing that hinders society, a thing that hinders innovation, hinders life. We only think of it as voting every two years. But that's not right. Government and governance, it's the water, it's the roads, it's the air we breathe. It's our duty to each other. But building maps aren't going to solve this problem, right? Like, democracy is a huge problem, and mapping is only like a tiny vertical of that. But we do need to make civic engagement more substantive. And we can't, and healthy civic behavior isn't something we can't just nudge people toward. Because not only do people tend to get resentful when we do that, it often is downright dangerous when we don't think through all the social implications of what we're pushing people to do. And that's why we can't just find problems. We have to find partners. We can't just build for people. We have to build with people. Because technology alone is never enough. All tech does is, is amplify power. It does so by connecting people in new ways so the question is, are we going to amplify oppressive systems or the people fighting them? So how do, how do we build new spaces for collaboration where people aren't just yelling at each other, but understanding one another? So this is something that the people in this room can do alone. This has to be done with people working in open data, in journalism, in technology, in activism. It has to be done working with policymakers. We need to be working across disciplines. We need to build relationships with our communities. And this is how we raise your voice, and the kid on the south side, and the two-spirit social worker, and the steel worker. This is how we bring up the everyday voices we all need to hear above the dapper white supremacist on CNN. It's through that work that we rebuild healthy democracy and save off the con artists and the charlatans. It's through that work we create spaces that raise the voices of the most vulnerable. 
Because when we make spaces to hear each other's stories, we understand each other more. We love one another more. We take each other's stories and make them our own. That's how we make ourselves a people. And that's how we raise each other up and create democracy that is just and equitable. So go, find the, find the storytellers, tell your story. Don't just, make, don't just make spaces for others, make space with others. My friends, don't stop telling stories. Thanks. Any questions or comments? I know they're out there. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was really, um, really interesting and a different way of looking at mapping. Um, a lot of the example slides you had up of things that you w would like ideally like to see, mm -hmm. like um, Alexa, show me where the pollution's coming from, or like yep. Google, what's the best way to walk in the most shade. Yep, those are really fun ideas, and I think it would be really, really awesome to have something like that implemented. The data collection for that would obviously be just Huge. enormous effort. Yep. Um, so, are you thinking about like? putting into OpenStreetMap options for adding that type of data, or how would you go about implementing that? I would Like, actually, ideally, sorry. <laughs> I would ask communities whether or not they actually want it. Like, these are just me randomly tweeting after Emily's talk in New York. Um, and I was like, this would be interesting for me, but I'm not sure it's actually interesting for someone else, but like, Let's go into communities and see what people actually want and build to that. Hi, um, my question is more of what forums do you think are best to um, improve civic engagement? Because you mentioned that the neighborhood was a really important mm -hmm. level, but how do you envision that happening? Um, I, um, I do research around something that in, in academia or actually in political science we call deliberative democracy or participatory democracy, which is where um, the residents or the citizens come and help shape, like we have a policy question, do we actually need bike lanes? And then citizens come in and they start going, what actually, what actual questions do we need to answer and what data is available and what data do we what more data do we need to capture to be able to answer, answer this question and it brings all the stakeholders in and they're we're not just giving them open data we're help we're working with the community to figure out the questions so we can figure out what data we need to capture like and involving everyone substantively in every part of the decision making process not just at the end where we vote and there are ways to do that at scale, like some of them are problematic, others work better, a lot are really experimental. But talk to me afterwards, like I can do hours on this. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, what communities are you working with? Is it mostly in North Carolina or um, others? Um, most of my, so I've mostly been doing research and most of my research has been around um, uh, the GovZero um, project in, or the GovZero civic hacking group in Taiwan. And so like, I don't know, Recently, I've been focusing on, on Taiwan since I'm Taiwanese, and I'm like, wait a minute, I should actually understand my family's home. So um, just for anecdotal reasons, um, would you be interested in sharing with us what um, they would want to see mapped in their communities um, based on the research you've done? My research there has been, um, 
So they have indigenous communities who have been, whose territories have been exploited by, um, by major businesses as well. And so um, luckily Taiwan is relatively rich, so they have decent maps for a lot of things. It's they're fighting legal battles more than like data battles. Um, and so the big thing there is they're needing um, uh, facilitated discussion or facilitated decision making like processes and they're trying to work through those and trying to figure out what works. All right, we just got time for one more question. Um, I wanted to add some more food for thought. A, a new trend and kind of the solution for gerrymandering is to get mathematicians more involved and in maybe creating algorithms to redistribute the voting blocks yep. and using census data. I was wondering if um, there were any other, anything else to maybe consider for the algorithm that can't be found in census data. The so my first job was working at a science policy nonprofit where we brought together mathematicians and, and legal scholars working on districting. And this is my personal opinion. Um, the more I think about how districting happens, like a fair, a fair district is one where it's literally a, a coin flip. Like that isn't fair democracy, that's rolling the dice. So. I say get rid of districts and have proportional representation, but that's me. All right, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll give one more round of applause as I felt like I was in church. <laughs> <laughs>